Support for Father David Abernethy and his ministry at the Pittsburgh Oratory of St. Philip Neri comes entirely from the donations of community members and listeners like you. The creation of future groups and podcast episodes depends on your commitment and generosity. We humbly ask that you consider a monthly gift of $10 to the Pittsburgh Oratory in support of Father David and his work. To make this or any gift, please visit www.thepittsburghoratory.org, click the Donate button, and write Father David in the Notes section. You can also make a recurring or one-time donation directly through Podbean. Your commitment and ministry-sustaining support are greatly appreciated. God bless you, and enjoy the podcast. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. Okay, welcome back, everybody, to our study of the Evergetinos. Uh, we are in the first volume, and tonight we are picking up again with Hypothesis 20 on page 152, and we're starting with letter B, halfway down the page. And if you remember, the basis of the hypothesis is the importance of uh, seeking the advice and taking the advice of elders, and not trying to travel the spiritual uh, life on uh, in accord with one's own judgment and understanding, but always seeking out the counsel of others. And um, they also spend a great deal of time here in this hypothesis about the importance of revealing one's thoughts. And this is very common uh, within the writings of, of the Desert Fathers, that it is with our thoughts that, the, we're, that we str- struggle with on a daily basis. And it's there often that the spiritual battle takes place. And so a willingness to uh, lay all these thoughts out before one's elder and uh, let them come into the light in order that they might be seen for what they are in order to know healing. And the stories are a little bit longer, as you'll see here in, in this section, uh, but uh, they uh, do make the point very clearly. So I'll try to make my way through them, not rushing, but uh, try, we'll try to make our way through them without it becoming sort of burdensome. Again, on page 152, for those who just joined. Once when St. Savas left for the desert during Lent, as was his custom, and was staying there, one of his disciples, Iacovos by name, who was from Jerusalem and well known for his impertinence, displayed even worse than normal conduct. And after pulling astray, other monks, like him, into foolishness, left the monastery and went into the valley called Hyptostomos. There he attempted to found his own monastery, building cells and constructing a church, and in general, establishing all that is appointed for a monastery. So, not a good start for uh, Iacobos, uh, known for his impertinence. Uh, and so, what when the superiors away he makes an independent decision even to start a new monastery however since the brothers became greatly irritated against Iacovos and would not allow the construction to proceed further Iacovos adding to his criminal acts lied to the monks telling them that all this was supposedly occurring in accordance with the will of their father and abbot Saint Savas As soon as the monks heard this information, they stopped obstructing him in the the construction. They were not freed, however, from their internal sorrow that they felt, as they saw with their own eyes Iacobos taking away much of their former monastery. Nevertheless, since they believed that Iacobos was telling them the truth, they kept silent, awaiting the return of their spiritual father, St. Salvas. So uh, a terrible thing, you know, lying to the community and then taking the property of the main monastery uh, under the guise of having the the support uh, and the permission of the superior in order to build another monastery for himself. So it's not only lying, but basically it was stealing as well. 
After the time of Lent had ended, the divine Savas returned to the monastery, having seen what had happened with his own eyes. He immediately called Aikovas, imploring him with a fatherly, in a fatherly way to stop the work, since the course which he had undertaken was neither pleasing to God nor in agreement with the opinion of the brothers, but also because it was very dangerous for Aikovas personally to take on the responsibility of other souls as a spiritual father when he had not yet trained himself very well. The Divine Father Savas advised Aikovas to in this manner, with meekness and in a father with fatherly way. However, since he saw this, saw that Aikovas objected and did not want to obey, he set aside his usual leniency and said to him more sternly, my son, I believe that I have advised you in, I'm sorry, I have advised you is in your interest. However, since you will not obey, Take care that you are not taught what is in your self-interest only after having come to great injury. So even when the superior returns, he's unwilling to receive his counsel. And so sh showing the truth of basically what St. Savas was seeing, that uh, this was not a man to be starting a monastery or taking others under his spiritual care, that he was not willing to live in obedience himself. And it's often said that, you know, only those who would be elected superior, who's, who've lived long years in obedience and have shown themselves to have this capacity uh, to live it fully in order to be able to expect it from, from others and to be able to guide others. Tyler writes, this kind of reminds me of the career-centric mentality that Pope Francis has warned clergy against clergy trying to obtain Monsignor or mitered archpriest status. Yes, you know, kind of clericalism, but uh, <clears throat> self-focus, certainly, self-interest, as you had, had mentioned here, that, you know, this is certainly a danger in, in the spiritual life as well and within the life of the church, climbing the clerical ladder, as it were, and positioning oneself in order to do so. Let's see. Where did I leave off there? As soon as he had said this, St. Savas left the monastery. Iacobus began at the same moment to tremble in his body and came down with a high fever. Shortly, he fell sick into his bed and for eight whole months was tormented, suffering from this curious illness. Now, when he had lost even his last hope that he would be healed and was approaching death, he remembered the disobedience he had shown to St. Savas. At once then, he implored with persistence those around him to lift the bed on which he lay because of his illness and to take him and place him at the feet of the great saint that he might forgive me, as he said, for my disobedience so that I will not die unforgiven. So he begins to experience the, the consequence of his own disobedience. Uh, whether this is from the hand of God or arising uh, out of his own guilt, the acknowledgement of his own disobedience. You know, he begins to experience the fruit of that, which is an illness unto death. And in the realization of it, he's humbled by the illness in body as well as in mind and seeks to be brought to St. Savas in order to receive his forgiveness. There is something about illness that does bring a kind of clarity. Uh, not that we would wish that upon ourselves or anyone else, uh, but it does bring a kind of clarity to one's life uh, because a lot of the external realities are stripped away in terms of their importance. The, the goals that we seek for ourselves, elevated status, you know, when we begin to lose one, our health, you know, all of those things shrink in their importance and their value. And it allows what is necessary to become clear to us. And in this case, uh, it was his need for repentance and his need to seek the forgiveness of St. Savas. Indeed, his wish was granted, and in a short while, Iacovos, on the sickbed, was taken to St. Savas. The saint, after looking on him with meekness, he who is indeed meek and compassionate, told him a sweetness. Have you learned now, my brother, what the fruit of impertinence is? Have you adequately learned it? 
Do you understand what the results of the lack of discipline and disobedience are? Uh, so it's interesting, the, the author here emphasizes his meekness and compassionate uh, character. And meekness, I often think, is a misunderstood virtue. Uh, that it often, I think in, in the West, is, it has this connotation of weakness. Uh, and re when in reality, it is a, uh, a strength that a person has. It's a virtue, and it's the capacity... I think to have something like anger be transformed and ordered by the grace of God, by love. And so even in his certain disappointment and frustration with Iacobus, with meekness, he corrects him. And with compassion uh, to the state that he had been brought to because of his sin. And uh, I think what struck me here was that uh, he puts these questions to him. And even as you're reading them, uh, you could sort of read into them uh, that uh, St. Savas has a sense that he doesn't really know the weight of his own disobedience and the consequence of it yet. You know, have you adequately learned it? Do you understand that the results of the lack of discipline and disobedience are and it sort of plays out as we will see in the rest of the story. But despite his illness, it doesn't penetrate, I think, uh, the depth of his disobedience. That there was, again, this impertinence within uh, Iacovos that prevented him from receiving even this, this meek and gentle counsel uh, from the hand of the saint. Aiko was able to open his lips only with effort, since these had also become closed from the illness, answered, Forgive me, honorable father, because I am preparing for my last journey. Again with love, St. Savas answered him, May God forgive you, my brother. And at the, very, at, at the very time that he spoke these words, he placed his hand on the ill man. His hand became a source of strength for the sick Aikovas. And oh, the wonder! Whereas he had been at death's door, he now sat up. Thereupon he received communion and bodily sustenance followed, sustenance followed on that divine food. In this way, Iacovus was slowly nourished and strengthened. To the surprise of all, he became completely well and rose from his bed more easily and surely than those who are well. So St. Savas comes to his aid, not only in offering correction, uh, but uh, through his intercession, seeking his healing. And so he's restored to, to full health. Since Iacovus was totally healed, since I was imposed a canon on him for his insubordination, that he should never again return to the new construction site, the site of his disobedience. However, Patriarch Elias, as soon as he was informed of the entire matter, did not consider it good that these structures of Dis dis disobedience should re yet remain upright, and thus sent men immediately to knock them down totally. After this, the divine Savas, wishing to show Iacovus to be a child of obedience, entrusted to him the service of caring for visitors. Once it so happened that Iacovus cooked some beans, and since he was totally inexperienced and untrained in cooking, and in reckoning the required amount of food, he prepared so many that the leftovers from these cooked beans were enough for three days. But on the second day, Akovas threw the remaining beans into a ravine, which was near the monastery, as though they were worthless refuse. This action, however, did not escape the attention of Blessed Salvas, for as the saying goes, the wise man's eyes are in his head. Immediately, therefore, without anyone realizing it, he went and gathered the scattered beans, spread them out in the sun so that they would dry out and store them. So fools walk in darkness, uh, I think is what that saying from Ecclesiastes is meant to tell us. And whereas the wise man's eyes are in his head, that even if all is darkness around him, that he has a vision of the truth and is able to follow it. So Savas is able to see what is going on with Iacovos here. Uh, not only is he acting in his ignorance when entrusted with a small matter, uh, 
uh, and uh, again, a matter of obedience, uh, is not able uh, to act in a wise way, that he, not having lived in obedience himself. And if you remember, obedience was often, the, or the work of the monastery was often given the name obedience. So carrying out one's daily work was a way of forming and shaping the heart. And so we even see here in Iacovus that his, his incapacity to carry out even the most basic duties of a monastery, which would have been preparing a meal. And uh, he's not able to prepare the, the right amount. And then even with the leftovers, he's ignorant of what to do with them. And he throws them away as if they were refuse. And so uh, Sava seeing this again has to intervene uh, that, uh, you know, to help Iacovus come through this, hopefully. After a little time had gone by, he called Iacovus so that the two of them could eat together. For food at this common table, he served beans which Iacovus had shortly before thrown into the ravine and which St. Savas had prepared with skill so that the meal served to them was most delicious and pleasing. As they were eating, the divine Savas, in order to test Iacovus, said to him, Forgive me, my brother, but perhaps I have not pleased you with my food that I would have wanted, since I do not have a great deal of experience with foods and seasonings. Then Iacovus answered with enthusiasm, On the contrary, Father, I so enjoyed these beans that I can assure you that it has been a long time since I tasted such sweet and delicious food. St. Savas, speaking a second time, said to him, did you know, my child, that this food was made from those beans which you yourself a short while ago threw away into a ravine as worthless? It is now time for you to think about this. If a person cannot even manage to take care of a pot of beans so that the amount cooked should correspond to the daily needs and his work not be aimless, can he consider capable, can he be considered capable of taking on successfully the guidance of brothers? As proof, it is worthwhile to remember the apostolic saying, for if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he care for the church of God? So how would Iacobus then be able uh, to take on the responsibility of an entire monastery and the care of souls when he's not able to care for himself, make right judgment, even in small matters, where within his own heart, he has been inattentive to his own formation. How, what makes him think then that others could live under obedience to him when he has not from the beginning, clearly? And so it's a good story for us, I think, to hear because uh, we hear within the gospel, you know, those who are entrusted with small things then eventually become entrusted with greater things if they are faithful. And so what was true for Iacovos is true for all of us as well, uh, especially in the life of virtue and in the grace that God bestows upon us, that our fidelity in taking hold of that grace and uh, allowing it to bear the fruit that God desires for us in our life. And so not just taking hold of it uh, and using it as we see fit or in accord with our own judgment, but specifically taking hold of it in this spirit of obedience, not in a willful way, but in a way that is guided by others, uh, that it bear, can bear the most fruit. And, uh, you know, in our, again, we've often talked about our individualism, radical individualism in, in the West, and so su submitting ourselves uh, whether it's in the workplace or the home, uh, to the judgment of others, allowing oneself to be guided by them is something that we can resist. And uh, I grew up with all these uncles who were, they were like blue collar workers, but they are, were also tough as nails. They were all military men. And, you know, a number of them were within, you know, in the war and certainly my Grandfather was in World War I, did two tours of duty, and so he was tough as nails. But there was this expectation that if we, when we were visiting, 
you know, he'd, he'd hand you the broom to sweep off the porch. So you weren't sitting around uh, idle. And nor would you say no to something like that, too. Or, or they would have you do tasks like tar, helping them tar the roof or something like that. And uh, so you don't, I, I guess what I'm saying is that we don't often find that in our own day and age, where at an early age, we are raised under the authority and sort of like the, the meek and compassionate, like uh, St. Savas of uncles, fathers even, who guide us in, uh, in how we live our life and how we're attentive to others, learning the basic task uh, in order to be able to care for ourselves, to help care for the family, to take care of these small duties. So that then as we age, we can be entrusted, entrusted with things that are of greater importance and be able to allow, able to do them on our own. Sort of like driving a tractor, right, Vicky? <laughs> uh, so, you know, I Kovos, and, and so for monks reading this, this would have been an important story uh, because I Kovos did not learn the basic lessons of obedience that his impertinence, his resistance to following the counsel of others, even in the smallest of ways, really hobbled him in terms of his capacity to live the monastic life. And it more than hobbled him, it was destructive to the community itself. It put the community in chaos. And it was only through you know, the, the wisdom as well as the sanctity of uh, Savas that things were able to be rectified for the monastery. And this is where dioceses for, and religious communities have to be really very discerning uh, about those that they would receive into training for ministry or entrance into a community. And I remember St. John Paul II saying, you know, this was not the time to be lowering the standard. In fact, it should be just the opposite, that we should be considering the things that are really at the heart of formation. And it's exactly what we're reading about here that is needed. And one could say it's needed not only in the monastery, but for Christians as a whole, in the family, and for training uh, of priests. And, uh, you know, so much of our training these days has to do with the formation of the mind, the intellect, and uh, maybe not so much living under uh, obedience. And it's interesting, I heard something recently, Pope Francis saying, and I know this is probably going to honk off a lot of future seminarians, uh, but of having guys do a year before even entering into pre-theology, into the pre-theology. And, and because I think he sees something wrong there in, in the sense of how men are entering into uh, the spirit of their ministry. It's sort of what Tyler mentioned here, that there can be you know, this kind of career-centric mentality uh, and not the sense of uh, maybe service or humbling oneself uh, before others, whether it's before one's bishop or, or pastors in order to receive that guidance and counsel. And, uh, and so wanting them to have more time. And I understand that. You know, I think for religious, you know, we have a very long novitiate. And even there, I mean, it, three years really isn't all that much time. Uh, the, the, I think in our day and age, you really just begin to see the beginnings of formation. And even then, often guys are sent off to study, uh, you know, during some part of that. And what Pope Francis is saying is he doesn't want them studying at all during this period, that he really wants them to be immersed in a deep formation and in order that their studies might bear fruit in the future. And I think what we're reading here shows us why. It allows us to frame, frame that and understand it in the right way, that it's the formation of the mind and the heart to be able to be conformed to Christ in this spirit of obedience that will allow their ministry to bear fruit 
And if they are willful in that ministry, and they set themselves up as, you know, little oligarchs in their, or, you know, in their parish, then, you know, it's not gonna, going to bear much fruit. I think this is what Pope Francis was saying, you know, smelling like the sheep, you know, being in their midst, but serving them and living in a kind of obedience. And so I think he wants seminarians really to be in the parishes serving in whatever capacity uh, in, in order that they might learn that. It's funny, we've had guys go through the novitiate partially here at the oratory over the course of the years. And it can be quite a shift and a jar, jarring to the sensibilities to have to take the garbage out daily and empty the dishwasher, among other things, plunging toilets, whatever it might be, uh, after you've studied you know, and gotten a master's at Carnegie Mellon or someplace like that, you know, to be doing, you know, this kind of work can be humbling. And, uh, but Philip Neary, our founder, was pretty clear about that. He didn't hesitate to tell guys, pack it up, you know, that God does not need men, you know, with a few truly detached and obedient souls, he could do far more. And through this story, again, I think we see why. So where do we leave off here? This and many other similar things did the Blessed Savas discuss with Ayakova, succeeding at the same time in correcting him in the spirit of wastefulness, inspiring him in economy, and also reproaching him for his previous arrogance, ensuring that the future, in the future he would not become corrupted by such a passion. After this, he let Aikovos leave with his prayers and his blessing. So even in the face of everything that Aikovos has done, uh, how destructive it was that we see great mercy here on the part of St. Salvas and trying to help form his heart, to reproach him gently and to show him through this example uh, of, of, the, you know, of the waste of the beans, as well as you know, applying certain penances, that he tries to guide him along the path that he needs to walk. Sometime later, while Iacovus was once resting in his cell, he was bothered by an indecent, by indecent carnal thoughts. And the tempest which arose in him from these obscene desires became great and unbearable. Iacovus res resisted valiantly these indecent thoughts and for a great while. In time, however, terrorized by the sea of temptations and thinking that in the end, the tempest would not cease. This thought, of course, came in its entirety from the evil one and was one of his machinations and cunning methods. And with his mind darkened, neglecting the holy canons, he took a knife and cut off his general organs, curing in his most horrible way, evil by evil, being unable to bear the pain or to stop the bleeding, he began to cry out and scream for help to those who hear him. Boy, this is, these have been two rough weeks for me to read this with a straight face. Uh, but uh, so very much like the character Origin, if some of you have heard, it's thought that perhaps he did something similar. And so we, we really see, I think, how deep this spirit of disobedience ran within the heart of Akovos and, uh, and how, how great the impertinence was and that he uh, you know, rejects the canons and rather than engage humbly in that battle and to acknowledge the poverty of his sin or the, the nature of the thoughts that he was having. And remember the next part of this hypothesis is focusing on the revelation of thoughts freely uh, and un in an unvarnished way to one's superiors in order to be healed. Rather than doing this, he mutilates himself. Uh, you know, and so embraces the temptation fully and the cunning of the evil one uh, to go to the extremes. Although I could think of a couple other extremes that would be you know, a little better than this one. Why not fasting, you know, fiercely or sleeping on the floor, 
rather than this. But uh, so, but we see here again, you know, just how deep uh, the, the 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 sin and the evil ran. The monks ran to him immediately, and seeing this fearful self mutilation, began at once to offer first aid to Arcovos, essaying to relieve his pains. The matter, however, became known to St. Savas as well. Thus, as soon as Iacovus recovered a bit from the pain, St. Savas expelled him straight away from the monastery as an enemy to himself and as an evil self-mutilator. After this, Iacovus experienced a painful repentance. The pricks of conscience bitterly tortured his soul. Earnest tears poured forth, and he groaned mournfully. It was a totally pitiful and lamentable thing for anyone to look upon him, and in his misery, he invited the sympathy of all who saw him. Forrest wrote, he cried out to his neighbors too late. That's right. And no, not really even crying out. Yeah, except until he had mutilated himself. So crying out for, for their help at that point, but not crying out in the way that wisdom would have him do so. Any thoughts, any other thoughts before we move on? Ren, is Iacovo's failure to reveal thoughts to an elder and his extreme action another manif manifestation of arrogance? Yes, because, I, you know, pr pride leads to shame. You know, we want to protect our self-esteem. And we'll get into this further on in the hypothesis, but this is often what will prevent us from revealing our thoughts freely, you know, whether it's in the confessional or to our spiritual director, that we often can be embarrassed or feel ashamed and so hide things. And uh, with Icobos, you know, you could see the, uh, the machinations of the evil one, as it's said in the text, that he can wait and be patient and then strike him down in a, you know, this horrendous way, you know, foster this kind of disobedience spirit all along, and then hit him with this wave of indecent thoughts, which he could have been healed from if he would have humbly acknowledged them to St. Savas. And yet, instead of doing that, he tried to take matters into his own hands to free himself from them. And so definitely, there's an arrogance and pride there that prevented him from doing what was needed. Ego often will step into the, you know, into the frame. We want to protect some shred of dignity for ourselves. And I think humility has to say, no, it's the truth, living in the light of truth that brings healing. And so we can't hold on for a moment, you know, to, this kind of self-esteem. Tyler writes, it seems very relevant as it shows what happens in those instances where people who say, who say they need accountability partners, if you will, do not have the courage to admit their weakness and seek help. Right, so accountability partners, we I see this arising more and more especially in groups of young men that who struggle in our day and age, you know, as everyone uh, I think is aware of that there's a great struggle with pornography and it leads really almost to a kind of addiction, a passion uh, that is so deeply rooted that it can lead guys into depression and despair in the spiritual life. And so they will often seek out accountability partners. So those who are on the journey with them that they, you know, on a daily basis, even if needed, will acknowledge, you know, the breakdown of their discipline or ways that they have exposed themselves to temptation or particular, or particular falls. So it's interesting, almost intuitively, they're doing what the fathers are saying. You know, somebody along the line, whoever, you know, put the idea to, to young men first about this, you know, had to be aware of the teachings of the fathers. Uh, Forrest, you quoted St. Philip Neri in the past, in the warfare of the flesh, only cowards gain the victory, that is to say, those who fly. Absolutely, that uh, this is one of the things that we often don't 
uh, want to acknowledge and our pride wants you know to keep us uh, in that moment of temptation rather than fleeing the circumstances. And so especially when it comes to the bodily passions, Philip's counsel, one, you know, Philip, as we know, was deeply rooted in the fathers, you know, said to, to flee. The, the real victor is found there, one who doesn't put himself to the test in a prideful fashion. Uh, right before him, Anthony wrote, is the fi finality of this mutilation the problem? Other saints ran into thickets to hurt their bodies, and they are saints. <laughs> Tyler Wilson, fly you fools. Gandalf, <laughs> a little Lord of the Rings humor there. So we know who the nerd in the group is now. <laughs> uh, well, we last, I think it was in the Comicus group on uh, last Wednesday, someone asked about the extreme uh, asceticism of certain saints. And uh, one person brought up Rose of Lima, for example. And we talked a little bit about John Vianney, even acknowledging that in his youth, he uh, lacked discrimination, that he pushed himself too hard in regards to his fasting, and he did himself some bodily harm. And, uh, and so I think we could even look in a discerning way, um, although carefully, because we, we don't see all the reality, certainly of what was in the mind and the heart of a saint or what counsel they received. But I think whenever we see the extremes or the extraordinary in certain ascetical uh, behaviors, we really want to scrutinize it closely and be able to acknowledge the fact that, you know, the, the wisdom of the church and the wisdom of the fathers is to avoid the extremes, not to pamper the body. You know, the same Philip Neri said, heaven is not made for cowards, that mortification, not only of the intellect, but of the body was an absolute necessity. And so that we should not pamper the bodies, but be willing to discipline ourselves in uh, a deep way, but not to the point perhaps of self-mutilation. And cert certainly the great extreme of this would be what Icobos did. But I think there could be other forms of that too, where, you know, there's always a risk of a kind of uh, masochism, perhaps there, or self-hatred emer emerging, uh, that even, you know, the within the saints, uh, there has to be a purification of, you know, self-identity in Christ, one's life in Christ. And sometimes that's filtered through one's own judgment, imagination, understanding. So even in the greatness of their sanctity, like with John Vianney, as I mentioned, he could look back and humbly acknowledge, okay, I went to the extreme and ended up hurting myself. And, uh, and so gained a certain wisdom there. And so I think we can see that in their enthusiasm, their love for God, sometimes even the saints were driven to extremes. And so we have to be very careful, I think, in terms of what we put forward as the model. And that's why I think we would want to be rooted as deeply as we can in the fullness of the spiritual tradition and where the and also look to the church's guidance over the course of the centuries too, as it, as it has made judgments about asceticism and its nature and what that should look like for us as Christian men and women. So we don't want to pull out one example from one saint and make that the law, or and we have to be very careful about imitating a particular saint's form of asceticism that might be highly inappropriate for us and be very destructive or be, you know, extreme in its nature. Okay. Anthony, did you have a follow up there? Okay. Is our goal then to walk about in life with a serene soul and not be bothered by any temptation of body or mind, not distressing ourselves, but letting it pass well, that would be very nice if that were possible. 
but living in this world is, you know, we're going to experience sorrow and distress. And, you know, our lot in this world is to struggle with the passions, to struggle against the evil one and the temptations that come, uh, come to us. You know, we live in a fallen world where we're going to be subject to so many things that would want to pull us away from God. And so we can, having said that, I think we are called through the ascetical life and the life of prayer uh, to, especially in the hesychatic tradition, you know, fostering this internal stillness as well as external, that we can live uh, deeply within the peace of Christ, where one is keeping one's focus upon him in the face of all these realities within the world, and even in the face of our own poverty, uh, that we are able to maintain that experience of the peace of the kingdom. So we are making our way through what can be chaos in our life, turmoil, trial, and yet have within our hearts the peace of Christ, that we don't fall into despair or hopelessness. And uh, this afternoon I was reading uh, one of the Akhna elders, you know, one of the R Russian, you know, sort of modern elders. Uh, I think it was Markarius, if I remember correctly. Hold on for one second. It was uh, Markarius of Optina. Optina. He, he said, do not get lost in sorrow. Do not seek lofty gifts, but conduct yourself with humility. Feel compunction upon your beds for what you say in your hearts. Reproach yourself for imperfections. This is better than your lofty improvements accompanied by conceit. As long as we remain in this war, we must neither be bold nor despair. So again, sort of avoiding, you know, these two ways that we can be pulled out of that peace of Christ, you know, a kind of boldness that is rooted in conceit, where we're pursuing our own inclinations, even in the spiritual life or falling into despair because of the depth of our poverty and the realization that, that our passions have a deep grip on us, that what prevents us from going in one of those directions is having constantly before our eyes Christ, that we cleave to him, and that is where we, we find the peace. So the serenity that you speak of, is not something we create or anything that the world offers us. You know, left to ourselves or left in this world, we're only going to experience poverty. Our hope comes from one place alone, and that's from, from Christ. Forest. There is a connection to obedience mentioned in this story. He did not obey the monastic rule against self-mutilation. Absolutely. And, you know, it, it shows, you know, again, the depth of his impertinence and his disobedience, that even though it was clearly laid out for him, that, uh, that this was not to be done, uh, that he, again, chooses his own will over and above the wisdom of the church and the wisdom of the role. And, uh, and so we see the, the darkness that he is in. And, you know, it's sort of interesting having coming out of Holy Week. And, you know, when we reflect upon someone like Judas uh, and we think of the darkness that overcame him, and often, I, I think we can sort of see that as an extreme example, or we imagine ourselves as not taking that path, not being capable of doing something such as that, of selling Christ so cheap. And uh, yet, I think when we read these stories, we can see that we can be pulled into this kind of darkness the moment that we... Uh, step out of out of the frame of the grace of God and we begin to act under our own will and again you know not always to come back to Philip Neary but one of the things he said was there but the grace of God go I that he knew that outside of God's grace that he was capable of the worst of sins in fact 
uh, it, one of the one of his little sayings was that uh, God protect me this day, otherwise I will be betray you. And so that he knew that he was capable of doing exactly what Judas did, even after receiving communion, that he would is capable of betraying the Lord unless the Lord himself strengthens him and helps him embrace that grace in the way that God desires. So in a, in a sense, we have to pray for the grace that we receive the grace of God in the way that he intends it and as fully as he intends it. Okay. All right. Finding himself, therefore, in this sad state, Archivus went to the blessed Theodosius and confessed to him the awful carnal battles which had tortured him telling him about his self-mutilation and weeping over his expulsion from the monastery. Hearing this, Theodosius took a pity on him and went with him to the Blessed Salvus, imploring him fervently on the one hand to forgive Archobos and on the other hand to take him back in the monastery after having imposed on him the appropriate punishment. Indeed, St. Salvus gave in to the pleading of his friend but was also moved in so doing by his own innate goodness and compassion. Thus, he once again received Archovus into the monastery. He imposed upon him, however, various penances, among which was in order not to speak to or see anyone in the monastery ex expect, except when it was absolutely necessary in the course of fulfilling his duties. So Archovus again acquired his cell in which he kept silence, repented with great effort for all he had done, imploring God earnestly to forgive him, until at last he received forgiveness from heaven in the following manner, which we shall forthwith disclose. So, you know, we see the great compassion, and again, the great mercy of Savas, but also the wisdom, you know, of applying the healing balm. And uh, I saw a priest today on Twitter asking other priests, what kind of penances do you typically give people uh, in the confession? You know, what would, and, uh, and, you know, I understand certainly as a priest, the, the, the question and why it would be, why it would be asked. But I think what we see in the story is the, again, the wisdom of St. Savas of having lived the life of obedience and having struggled with the passions himself, uh, of understanding what was needed, what would be the healing balm. Not only the depth of the affliction could he see, but the, the net medicine necessary in order to bring about healing. You know, it still required Iacovos to respond to it and embrace it, but Savas could see what was needed and so offer the counsel that would bring about healing. And so there is reparation that is to be made, penance is to be applied here. And I think, you know, we, you know, these words carry a negative connotation in our day, but reparation is simply what it sounds like to repair the, the damage that sin or dis this disobedience has done, that a certain spiritual practice was given to him to live in obedience in order that healing might take place. And so it was silence, you know, not to engage in a free conversation with others, uh, but to live this life of, of, of deep penance and repentance. And we see, see that it begins to bear fruit within, within his life. There once appeared to the divine Savas a man brilliantly shining with effulgent rays of sweet light who stood near him and showed him a dead man who had been placed at the feet of Iacovos, who was praying to God for the dead man. In the meantime, a voice was heard from heaven saying, Iacovos, your prayer has been heard, therefore touch the dead man and he will immediately arise. After this exhortation, Iacovos indeed touched the dead man and he immediately got up. This illumined being turned to Salvus and told him that what what was portrayed in the vision had to be carried out at once. That is that Savas should go immediately from his cell and order 
that in the future, Arakovos was to be part of the gatherings of the brotherhood. And so Arakovos went to the church, spoke with the brothers and kissed them. Afterwards, he went to the blessed Theodosius with whom he exchanged the kiss of Christ. And on the seventh day after the vision departed with joy from the present life. So we begin to see, you know, the, the healing that takes place through finally the, the obedience that he fulfills, that he's humbled in these extraordinary ways, including by his own sin. And he's brought to healing uh, both through the, the guidance uh, of the saint, but also the saint's meekness and compassion that he's able to apply the remedy, but also to embrace him in love. And even his expelling him from the monastery was part of that, you know, allowing him to see the full consequence of his disobedience uh, is part of what brought him to his senses, very much like the prodigal son. You know, he experiences this extreme poverty, loses everything as well as part of himself, and in and through this, you know, comes to the realization of his, how deep the disobedience had become. And it's really this obedience that is healing to such an ex extraordinary extent that he's able then to raise somebody from the dead. But the one who had really been raised from the dead is Iacovus himself, you know, through, through his obedience. And that is the greater gift than the raising of, of the dead man you know it's what allows then god to work through iacovus in a way that he never was able to in the past because of his disobedience so it's the uh, it's the obedience that leads to the, ex uh, the the extraordinary thing that allows god to act through him so it's a, a a great story all around, you know, very difficult to read because it goes, the disobedience goes deeper and deeper. Uh, but I, I think there's a reason for that. I mean, we have to see on some level how far we can go, you know, into that. And this past weekend, we were reading a little bit from Archbishop Luis Martinez, uh, who I mentioned in one of the other groups. Uh, who I heard is, has been declared a servant of God, uh, but uh, he's written some really wonderful works. And the book that we're reading now is Worshiping the Hidden God. But again, he talks about this need to always be moving in the, on and on the path of humility, that while we're in this world, we never exit that path. And so our, our fundamental attitude before God is always to be that of humility, as well as uh, uh, acknowledging our nothingness outside of the grace of God. It's only by giving ourselves over to him fully, as well as acknowledging the poverty of our sin, that God then comes to us. God himself bows down to us to raise, pick us up and raise us up. And it's only when Icovos is brought to that, these dire straits uh, that, that God is able to do that for him. Any final comments about this particular story? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts about obedience in general? Ren, on the topic of penance, I find that penance, among other things, is valuable in revealing that extent to which a true spirit of repentance has been fostered in the heart. When I embrace my penance and perform it soon after confession, I'm eager to apply spiritual medicine to my soul. Often, however, I'm reluctant to accept penance, anxious about what the priest will give me, and am slow in performing it then it is revealed to me that the spirit of repentance really hasn't been fostered well in my heart. It's an interesting thought because I think, you know, the, the embrace of it, as you mentioned, freely and fully uh, at that moment when it's given, 
and not seeing it as seeing it in a punitive way, but as medicinal, then like so many of the things that we've talked about in the past, it should be something that we love, that this is what God has given to us as the path to return to him. And anything that aids us to move swiftly upon that path is to be embraced and cherished. And so whatever is given to us by the priests, uh, even if, you know, it, it seems harsh or challenging or difficult to us, should be embraced as, uh, even if it's simply in obedience, you know, that it will bear great fruit for us. So even if on the surface, it doesn't seem as though it would be something medicinal to us or, or it doesn't seem to be enough you know, going in the other direction, simply by being obedient to one's confessor and doing the penance that's given is something that's healing. Forrest wrote, the consequences in this story were more lenient than the Old Testament law, Numbers 15, but anyone who acts defiantly, whether a native or an alien, reviles the Lord and shall be cut off from among the people. For having despised the word of the Lord and broken his commandment, he must be cut off entirely and bear the punishment. But if a prophet presumes to speak the word in my name that I have not commanded or speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. Wow. Yes. So more, more lenient, but I think because coming from a place of greater perfection, you know, coming directly from God. And so not through. Uh, uh, a mediator like a prophet but from God himself and so one that can be embraced uh, and can be far, far more life-giving you know I think there is a kind of harshness in what the passage that you offer us here from numbers uh, because of the distortion that can enter into or the disobedience either on the part of the prophet or of the individual receiving the prophet's word. Whereas, you know, the grace that comes to us uh, is such that it can lift us up and help us, you know, by both putting within our hearts that spirit of repentance, but a willingness to embrace the discipline that is given to us, not so much as punitive, but as something that is life-giving. And, you know, I, I think part of our history, and I think maybe why people walked away so, so much from the spiritual tradition and some of the practices of piety and the, these disciplines that we've been talking about is the disconnect in people's mind, you know, to what, what fruit are penances, uh, you know, of going to confession, receiving a penance from a, a priest what fruit is that bearing in my life? Or is there healing that is taking place? Is there a particular understanding of the sins as they are being confessed in order that a remedy might be applied? And so I think there's a, a disconnect there because simply applying a certain penance without discerning what what is actually going on with the individual, but also lacking the meekness and the compassion that we find in St. Savas is not going to bear fruit. And I think that what, what many in previous generations felt was that, you know, that it was more of a punitive kind of thing and that you would say it and be done with it. And it was like, you know, you do the crime, you know, you what, what, what is it you do the crime pay the time or something like that or or do the time right commit the con crime d do the time uh so you know penance becomes this kind of legalistic uh practice you know that you say three rosaries and that sort of uh gives a kind of release to you know, on an emotional level is cathartic, you know, gives a kind of uh, temporary peace to the conscience, but is it necessarily something that is healing? Like outside of the context of everything that we've been speaking of, as, you know, Christianity being an ascetical religion, 
as repentance being a constant reality for us, this constant movement toward God rather than something episodic. And seeing, you know, our life outside of this reality of the struggle with the passions, uh, the, the development of the virtues of praying without ceasing, then it is going to very quickly devolve into a kind of mechanical or legalistic practice that really does not bear fruit for individuals. And so immersing ourselves in the full tradition to be able to see these things uh, and the blessings that they are to us and the healing that they bring. St. Isaac the Syrian, who we just finished not too long ago here at the oratory said that uh, one who can see his own sins is greater than he who can raise the dead. So the individual who has the capacity to see the, the depth of his own sin, his passion, uh, has the capacity to repent or to embrace the practices that can bring about healing to the soul. And that this is far greater than someone who can perform this extraordinary deed. And we've, we saw that in some of the early stories uh, I think in the Evergetinos uh, at the very beginning, the emphasis on repentance and its importance and its ultimate value. Deborah, if you can't do the time, don't do the crime. Yes. <laughs> I'll remember. I'll use it in a homily now. <clears throat> so any other comments or thoughts? Ren, Arcobus does seem like a bit of a hopeless case. I wonder if his quick death after this last act of repentance was not an act of mercy on the part of the Lord. Take him out before he can screw up again. <laughs> wow, a mercy killing. <laughs> uh, well, you know, in the providence of God, you know, I, I, certainly we see and have seen in some of the writings of the fathers and even within the Evercatinos, you know, those who, after the repentance, die very quickly. And what it shows us is the power and the importance of repentance and the mercy that it brings to the individual. But, you know, I think in circumstances like this, that we can see, you know, this long history with Iacobos of, you know, turning again and again uh, back to this, you know, and being drawn back into the spirit of disobedience. And that even with all the help of his community of Theodosius of Sabas, you know, that he, you know, really has to come to this point of being broken down. And then, you know, ultimately he's freed and then, then dies. And there is, you know, I think sometimes when we understand, when we hear about death or what might seem to be even an untimely death, one of the things that we have to consider or think about is that in the providence of God, why would that be so? And, you know, can the providence of God be in, present in something that is so, so sorrowful or that seems to be a premature reality? Was there something there that God saw that even preserves a person and their salvation? Uh, Tyler, we'll never look at a pot of beans in the same way. We'll think that St. Savas from now on, especially going through a discernment process. Yes, very much so. This would be a good, uh, actually a good story for those discerning uh, priestly life to read. Anthony, I'd like to see us Catholics build on the theme of St. John Damascene Repentance is turning away from the unnatural living toward the life of God intended for us. That is a kind of repentance that I could more easily understand instead of afflict yourself, meaning that is perennially popular among Catholics in different rites. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, I think this is what we've been seeing in all the writers that we've looked at. This view of repentance, again, not as a static reality or simply a uh, afflicting oneself but as relational you know this turning toward god and in order to receive his mercy and how quickly that brings upon us a flood of mercy and how hopeful we can be 
of God, giving us the grace that we need, not only of forgiveness, but all that we need in order to struggle with the passions. And so, yes, I, I think desperately we need to, you know, whether it's St. John Damascene or, or the other writers that we've looked at, you know, to be able to immerse ourselves, you know, at least in the spirit of what they are saying here. Because, you know, uh, people begin to lose faith, even in something as precious, you know, we know as the Eucharist or of the gift of confession, uh, or come to fear it, you know, have this anxiety about it, avoid it, you know, rather than seeing it as this embrace, moment of embrace, the embrace of God, or something that brings joy, as we hear in the scriptures, to all of heaven, you know, of our turning back to God, and that brings us that flood of grace and mercy. Uh, again, there's often too much of the attitude that you describe as being, you know, something that afflicts us. But I chastise my body and bring it into subjection. Yes, you know, more, you know, to mortify oneself is sort of what the word tells us, you know, it's uh, that we're dying to self-will and uh, and to ego, and so the ordering of the desires and that we have as human beings uh, is an essential part of the spiritual life. It's what I mentioned, Philip Neary saying that both ex external and internal mortification is an absolute necessity, given what we struggle with, the weakness of our will, the darkness of intellect, that all of our mortifications is to redirect us toward God and to foster this deeper desire for him. And so it's not, again, just chastising uh, the body in the sense of punishing the body. Because again, I think it's very easy to fall into a kind of, you know, a kind of masochistic view there that it wouldn't be very far from what we see in uh, sort of some obsessive compulsive behaviors that can become you know, take a, a hold of a person in this very unhealthy way. That if you remember, we said that asceticism can also be a defense mechanism. It can be a way of controlling one's emotional state. And so the great temptation can be to punish oneself in order to alter what's going on internally. This is why people cut, you know, and do things such as that, you know, wounding the body uh in in different ways uh because it it is a very powerful thing it alters the state alters brain chemistry fasting can do that as well and so we have to be very careful that we don't lose sight of the relational aspect of all of this that are it, what it is is to foster the desire the hunger for god and if the asceticism becomes an end in and of itself, if the mortification becomes an end in itself, it's, it's a distortion and it's not going to bear fruit. Most likely it will produce the fruit that we see here in Iacovas, which is self-mutilation. Self Ashley, you'll be our, our final thought for the night. It's kind of long, sorry, I have thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> some of these holes Iacovus has dug himself even to the severity of mutilating himself and being cast out of his community are reminding me of the reflections of St. Bernard of Clairvaux on the Song of Songs specifically the kisses prior to let him kiss me with the kiss of the lips which to the angels and saints seems to be an offensive desire like Iacovus wanting for more than he is currently trustworthy of. It is for this reason that St. Bernard goes into the prior kisses, namely the kiss of the feet of Christ, that Iacovus would have to humble himself under the instruction of Savas and return to the feet of Christ to kiss his wounds for the realization of the cost of his sins, and then extend his arm up that Christ might draw him upwards so that he could eventually kiss his hands entering into the life of virtue and friendship with Christ, hence the fruit of reparation. Wow, you do have a lot of thoughts uh, and ideas. 
But beautiful. And I'm glad that you connected to the Western tradition too, Bernard Clairaut. And I think you're exactly, you're on point with your analysis of what was taking place there. And it's sort of along the same lines as Luis Martinez that I'd mentioned too, that when we take ourselves off of that path of humility and sort of look upward or reach upward, God pulls away. It's when we keep ourselves on that path of humility, so kissing the feet, acknowledging the cost of our sin, as you said, then God bends down to us in order to lift us up and exalt us. He who humbles himself will be exalted. So if one, as you said, reaches up for this deep intimacy of contemplation, the kiss of the, of the mouth, you know, that there's a distortion there, you know, that uh, of, of pride and arrogance that one could uh, move to this intimacy without acknowledging the truth of one's own, the poverty of one's own sin. You know, the, the intimacy that one would be seeking would be based upon a lie, you know, or of, of unwillingness to see the truth fully. And again, I think this is why they emphasize humility so much, because it's truthful living. It's not, not just, it's not self-contempt, self-hatred, but it's the truth that allows us then to be lifted up by God to this greater intimacy with him. But so long as we cling to the illusion that we are w worth more because we've done this or that, you know, because of what we've done on our own, then we're, we're failing to see what is most necessary about the spiritual life. So excellent. You know, and I'm, I'm always glad when we can sort of tie the Eastern writers to the Western as well, even though the language and the imagery can be quite different. Wow, very good. So we only got through one story, but that's that's okay. And uh, I thought I'd move through it a little more quickly. I stumble when I read too fast anyway, so it's probably not the best thing to do. Okay, so we'll close there for this week and pick up with the, the next from the Durant Con. And uh, but as always, let us close with the Our Father in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. The Lord be with you. I'm going to God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Go in peace. Thanks. Thank you, God. God. I'm always struck by the these stories from the Evergetinos. You know, I, I don't think we would be able to penetrate the meaning of something like obedience and how the fathers understood it without these stories and without struggling with them. Uh, and, you know, seeing Iacobus's life from all these different perspectives and the struggle with his impertinence and his disobedience. There's something very powerful about that that, you know, I haven't encountered in some of the other writings. Climacus is a lot like this, too, although he does it with greater brevity. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, it's really a powerful instrument in that regard. These little stories, memorable especially the last couple that we've read. <laughs> so, okay, everybody, have a great week.